Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. And in this series of episodes, we've been dealing with how we've uh, enjoyed a, a kind of a love affair with the automobile through uh, uh, most of the life of the automobile itself here in, a, in Escambia County in Pensacola. And in our last episodes, we've uh, designed, uh, developed the, the story of uh, who the first automobile makers were, who our first uh, dealers were in Pensacola, which of the automobiles we sold and serviced here. And then in the last episode, we talked a little bit about some of the things that uh, early automobile owners had to deal with in the way that, that they treated and ran their automobiles, at least up through the 1930s. We, we begin our story today at a time in the early part of the 1930s when Pensacola, pe Pensacola's people just loved the automobile. We had, we had a, a population across the county of about 45,000, and at that point in time there were about 11,000, almost, almost 12, 11,000 and a half cars and trucks in the county, which illustrates how popular this had become. Now, when we moved into the 30s, of course, and the depression struck, all sorts of not, well, all things happened that were not good. Of course, people without jobs or with limited incomes uh, are not good customers for an automobile. And as a result of that, as we moved from 1930 through the 31, 32, 33, a great number of the, of the manufacturers makes that had, been, had become so popular, makes like the Stutz Bearcat, for example, uh, they just disappeared from, from the scene. They were, they were gone and gone forever. In Pensacola, uh, uh, many of the dealers did survive, although uh, uh, some of them, of course, departed as well. Now, as, as we come into the 30s, some new th additions are found. Now, one of the things that was introduced to the trade, to the automotive trade, came at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933 and 34, when the Ford Motor Company, as part of its exhibit there, illustrated how they were now making what they called safety glass. Now, previous to this time, all of the windows in a car or truck were made of conventional glass. And of course, the, a shattered window or a shattered windshield or something like that in an accident uh, was a, a terrible thing. It could uh, result in on horrible injuries. And the, safe, the uh, uh, safety glass, of course, was a, a wonderful invention. This made people so excited. And, uh, and that it, did, it, did, uh, it did include uh, uh, an incentive there for people to come in and say, well, it's safer for my family to have this. I'll, I'll go without something else if we can buy this car. Other things that began to come along now, now of course, were, were of equal interest to a lot of people. Number one was hydraulic brakes. Previous to that, all of the brakes on the cars were mechanical. They literally, uh, the, the brake pedal, pedal it, when it, with pressure was applied, literally did put the, the pressure on the brake drum and caused the car to slow or stop. Hydraulic brakes were totally different, and when they came on stream, of course, everyone wanted to have hydraulic brakes, and the General Motors Corporation in particular uh, profited from that. The next one was uh, what they, they called knee action. This was a, a new device, a new system that allowed the, the two front wheels to, to move uh, more, more casually over uh, 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 uneven terrain and made the driving uh, position much, much uh, more comfortable. And of course, knee action was then ac soon accompanied by better springs in a car because step by step we were making the, the, the emphasis on motoring more comfortable because more women were driving automobiles by this time. Of course, as we move into the, into the 30s, people are having to make their cars last. Uh, when, when, if someone had traded in every three or four years in prior years, now, now with the depression here, they couldn't do that. And so all sorts of measures were taken to try and make the car uh, last longer. One of the things that was perfectly obvious uh, was in what they called seat covers. Now, we don't see that much anymore, but in the 30s, of course, the, the conventional original seat covering on uh, front and back seats would wear and would get holes in it and so forth. And so a very enterprising company came out with a uh, basically an idea that you could simply put over the top of the seat, use drawstrings on it. They were very attractive, and the seat cover, of course, pr uh, produced a, a, a new addition to the, to the automobile. By the time we're, we're, we're to the mid-30s, uh, we are now beginning to get across the country a, a better network of roads. Because as we mentioned in the first episode, the early roads when automobiles came along were a pretty treacherous thing to have to drive. But now step by step and year by year, even with the depression, we were getting better ones. And of course, one of the things that the, the uh, New Deal administration tried to do during the course of the, de the depression years was to provide funds which would be used for road building and road improvement. And this happened, so that enabled people to travel longer distance. Well, if you go longer distance, of course, you're, you're obviously from time to time, you're going to have to stay overnight. And so now you begin to see a whole new vista of uh, accommodations rising up. 
The earliest ones that we, we see in any number are called tourist homes. This is basically uh, what today we would call a, a B&B or bread and, bed and breakfast. It was someone's, someone who would say, okay, we, we've got two or three extra bedrooms. We'll make them available. We'll put a sign up on the street or on the highway and say you can stay here overnight for $2 or something like that. And basically the tourist home came into being. About the same time, the idea of the tourist court was, uh, was originated. The tourist court was basically what we would today call a, a motel, except that most, in most instances, the, the, the places of, uh, of, uh, for sleeping were little, 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 uh, little huts, I guess, with little, little cottages. Uh, each one was an individual place, and the, the driver could drive right in, put his car beside the, the facility, and that was his place to stay. Uh, many times they did not have indoor plumbing, so many women didn't care for them a lot, but nonetheless, that was the second step, and we would not get into the, uh, the idea of the kind of tourist uh, accommodations that we have today until oh, a good many years after that. Now, as we went into the middle of the 1930s, the automobile industry itself was, was like everybody else. They had to cut costs frantically, and the, the price of an automobile began to come down, or at least the, many of them. Now, we have to remember that in the latter part of the 1920s, in the last years that Henry Ford produced his Model T, he had gotten the price of his car down, a two-door coupe of, uh, available from Detroit, he had gotten it down to just $265. Now, of course, you had to pay the transport to get it down to wherever you lived, but nonetheless, that was, that was a much advertised price. And by the time we get into the later stages of the 1930s, Chevrolet was selling its new cars uh, for about $700, which uh, a lot of people thought, well, that's a terrible amount of money. We, we still can't afford that, but nonetheless, that, that was basically an ongoing price. And about the same time, you begin to see other additions made to make for the comfort and, uh, and the security of driving. In, in the late 19th, uh, period of 1938, early 1939, the Ma General Motors and Chrysler both came out with a, an innovation. They took the gear shift off of the floor of the car and put it on the, on the, on the uh, steering post so that the, steering, the uh, driver could use his hand much more flexibly and he didn't have that obstruction on the floor. About the same time, the Studebaker company came, home, came up with another idea that they called the hill holder. Basically, this was a, an emergency brake which was placed on the left-hand side of the car beside the, the clutch from the, on the automobile itself. And when one had to stop on a hill, you simply press that as an emergency brake and it worked. Well, that allowed to take the, the old emergency brake off the floor of the car and we were making it a lot more roomy uh, for people driving in the front of the car itself. Now, let's suppose that you're in the latter part of the 20s, uh, 30s now and the depression is still with us. What did it cost to drive your car? Well, uh, a gallon of, of the lowest price price I ever saw for a, a gallon of gasoline was 12 and a half cents. Uh, there were others, the, the conventional brands, the, the uh, uh, Sinclair and, the, and, and Chevron and, and uh, Standard Oil Company and Gulf Oil, Pure Oil, they were probably on the, on the average selling for either 15, 16 or 17 cents a gallon, but that was basically it. A new tire at that point in time cost about five dollars. Uh, this is a replacement tire, of course, on your vehicle. And some of the niceties that you begin to enjoy uh, come along with it. Now, we are, we're in the latter part of the 30s, and now people be, with, with a, a bright look to the future, a number of uh, restaurant entrepreneurs begin uh, opening what they call drive-in restaurants. And basically, uh, this is a place where you could drive your car in, you parked, and a, a lovely young lady usually came out, sometimes even on roller skates, took your order and then deliver, delivered your hamburger or soft drink or whatever, right? And you put it on a tray on the, on the uh, window ledge of your car, and you ate lunch there. The drive-in restaurant was a, was a quite a success for a long time. The, almost exactly the same time someone else said, well, uh, it, we, a, a motion picture is, is inexpensive uh, uh, entertainment for the, for the family, but even so, if, you, if mom and dad go and they pay a quarter each and each of the children uh, uh, are charged 10 cents, you could still run up as much as a dollar going to the movies. So now the, uh, somebody else said, well, what we, we've got this vacant pasture out there, let's open a drive-in movie. And basically what would happen with the whole, the whole family in the car, drives in, parks the car, and they put a speaker line from a, a post inside the car. You're looking at a screen in the distance, and the drive-in movie would be a, a, a feature in the automobile industry for a long time to come. It, it didn't disappear locally here until well, well into the 1970s. Well, we come to, come to, uh, to the latter part of the 1930s, and a, a, another innovation, of course, comes to us here that really opens up the automobile traffic. It is in that year, 1937,
that Highway 98 is completed along the shore, allowing us to drive uh, our automobiles from here all the way to Perry, Florida. Now that was, uh, that was an innovation that was uh, sparked by a man named Edward Ball, who uh, literally, to get the county commissioners along the way to invest in, in bonds to build that road, he littered from, his, from the DuPont Company, he literally uh, helped underwrite them to assure that the bondholders would be uh, uh, reimbursed if something bad happened. So by 1937, we do have a highway along the coast. And the other roads, of course, the, the highway, 90, uh, highway 90 uh, is being improved at the same time. And they are just now redoing Highway 29, which had been completed, as I think we mentioned earlier, sometime earlier, because that, that highway connected Century and Alabama to us here on the southern part. Well, we moved into the, into the war years. Now, the war, of course, began in December of 1941, and almost immediately, automobiles were affected. They were affected, number one, because the government knew that they, the government and all agencies involved in the war were going to need all of the available cars and trucks. So within 60 days of Pearl Harbor, there was a definite a halt to sale of new cars. Uh, they were put on a what we would today call a priority list, and the government, of course, assured uh, who was going to get them. Uh, someone would have to have a, a really good use uh, set for them, uh, and counties and city governments and so forth were among them. The military, of course, having the highest priority of all. Now, as we move forward, of course, this meant the, 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 to drive a car, you, you're going to have some, other, have some other problems because we, uh, the country itself was facing two shortages. Number one was in that of rubber, and the second one was petroleum. Now, the petroleum shortage wasn't as critical as the rubber. We could, we could uh, drill for more oil and, and uh, produce more gasoline, but a rubber... Uh, the, the rubber plantations in the Far East were under the control of the Japanese, and we knew we weren't going to get any more of that. And consequently, rubber was very carefully rationed, and, new, and people were, were uh, given very careful uh, education and instruction on how to protect and preserve your car, your tires. A new tire, for example, was all but impossible to get. They were rationed, and only the highest priority could get them. So uh, a new, new businesses uh, came into play, how to, re, to put what they called a retread on an automobile, or a, uh, making a new, a new uh, addition on the outside of the casing. Uh, so we recap or retread tires. And for the next four years, basically that was the only choice you had. And people, believe me, they were, the people were very, very careful uh, not to drive excessively and to be very careful how they took care of their tires as far as inflation and all the rest of it. Now, through the war, of course, we have a, 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 a very great struggle for the, for the automobile dealers. They have no new cars to sell. Uh, used cars, of course, are a market, and the, most of the dealers who survived those years uh, did so by being very good at helping their customers maintain their cars, because all of the, the basic simple services were, in, were uh, ingrained in people. Uh, if you had a car and you knew you weren't going to get another one for two or three, four years, you did everything you could to stretch the, the wearability and the value of that car out, and, they, and people did. And that, that's basically the way it was. Uh, by this time, of course, where people are looking ahead, we're, we're, see, we're beginning by the time we got to 1945, where uh, the customer is beginning to see all sorts of wonderful future, futuristic uh, pictures and, and designs of what the cars in the future are going to look like. And they began to talk about all kinds of wonderful things that would be ad ad added. Uh, we had had the first experiment with an automatic transmission in 1941 with the, uh, with the Oldsmobile, but up to that point, beyond that, no, no, one, no other automobile had an automatic transition. And so as we approach the end of the war, people are saying, well, what, what ne what's going to come next? We, we can hope that we're going to have all sorts of wonderful things. There, there's talk about uh, uh, having air conditioning, and of course the, uh, the idea of even putting carpeting in cars to make them a little bit more luxurious. All of this is coming, and people can't, as the war winds down, you, they can't wait to what they're going to have when the new cars become available in late 1945.